Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this latest edition of Tales from Outer Space, where I take stories from across the internet and read them for your entertainment. This particular story is called Until There Are No More, written by Shane Vartson. Anchor hadn't known what to expect, but wandering around the small city threw her for a loop. That a city this small on a human world would have so many different species, it was too overwhelming to think about. She saw a group of Kurians like herself, bipedal, upright walkers with two manipulated limbs and two long, sensitive feeler tentacles that extended from above their four compound eyes. Anka's fur was a pale grey, a natural colour, but she saw stripes and designs and a myriad of colours on their fur. She approached the group with her feelers held tightly around her face, her hands turned palm up in a standard greeting, Hat e Alana. Yo, what's up? One of the males approached with his hands in an odd position, and none of them kept their feelers under control. You're new here. The accent was strange, but he was speaking galactic common. Yes, I'm newly enrolled in the university here. I've never been on a human world before. Seeing so many species, I, I felt lost uh, until I saw you. One of the females with hot pink stripes stood up and put an arm around her. Hey, sister. Don't worry, nobody's going to mess with you here, even those dudes. She motioned with her feelers towards two Krishaks, reptilian creatures built for and known for violence, wearing some sort of human uniform and drinking hot beverages. How are, uh, the, the, uh, are those soldiers or police? The group laughed. The female, with her arm around Anchor, answered, Nah, those guys are janitors at the uni. She raised her hand above her head and called out, Yo, frickin' frack, what's up? The Greshaks looked up at the group, gave them a little salute with their carry-out cups, and went back to talking. Their names are Frick and Frack. That's their nicknames. Can't remember their real names. I'm Madison, by the way. What's your name? Anchor. Y you have a strange name, Madison, but I find it aesthetically pleasing. Thanks. It's a human name. Most of us born on human worlds end up getting human names. Unless your parents hate you. Right, Zartrka? Madison's pronunciation of the traditional name for a firstborn son was atrocious. The click was too quiet and the consonants not properly stressed. Just call me X-Ray, he said. Well, Madison said, it's been fun, but we have a concert to get to. We'd invite you, but it's sold out. No hard feelings, Anchor? None. Enjoy your concert. As they walked away, Madison turned around and pointed. Oh, a decent Korean restaurant 400 meters that way. Anchor waved in thanks and wondered what a meter was. Was 400 of them a long distance or a short one? She would have to acclimate to human weights and measures, so it seemed like a perfect time to start. As she walked, she tried her best not to gawk at all the people ambulating by, walking, slithering, or even by hopping. Many were species she'd never heard of, much less met. Still, most of the ones who were not alone were the humans. A large group seated at outdoor tables in front of a cafe consisted of humans, Koreans, Krishanks, Kalathans, and another species she couldn't identify. This surprised her, since the Krishaks and the Kalanthas were still in a protracted cold war that had drug on since they ended hostilities seven periods prior. Everyone seemed to be enjoying themselves, and Anka noticed something else as she passed by. The humans seemed to be at least friendly, if not outright amorous with many of the non-humans. The next thing she noticed, some of them were eating arakluk, a Korean comfort food. She hoped, however, that this was not the place recommended, as the preparation seemed wrong. Anka's fears were unfounded, for the recommended place was just a little further down the way. The signs were in Korean common, galactic common, and several others she didn't recognize. As she stepped in the door, a slender human bowed his head slightly, holding his hands, palms up. He wasn't perfect, but the best he could do with no feeders. His pronunciation of Korean common was perfect. She returned the greeting in this casual form to let him know that he could relax. He welcomed her to the restaurant and told her about the daily specials and led her to a seat. She praised his command of her language and they shared a bit of small talk and she got his assurance about the quality of the food before she ordered the Arik Duk. While she waited for her food, she watched him. He greeted Kalanthus in one of their languages, Krishanks in one of theirs, and humans in four different languages. When he brought her food, she asked, How many languages do you speak? 
Eleven right now, he said, but I have a trip planned to Grishak Colony Worlds to pick up another one of theirs. Why do you learn all of these languages? Because I want to know more about people, and the best way is to let them tell you in their own words. He gave a wink and went about his business. She finished her meal, maybe not as good as her father's, but probably the best Eric clicked she'd had in a restaurant. As she pushed the empty bowl away, and the waiter came back. Can I get anything else for you? He asked in perfect Korean common. No, she answered, switching back to galactic common. Perhaps you could tell me where I could find human entertainment. Hmm. BJ and the Xenos are sold out, but there are some smaller venues with local bands that always have room. He offered his hand in the traditional human greeting. My name is Brad, by the way. Anka had practiced this before she came. She shook his hand. Very nice to meet you, Brad. I'm Anka. The pleasure is all mine. Look, I get off work in about an hour. Can I put my contact in your com? If you still haven't found anything to occupy you by then, give me a call. I'd love to take you to my favorite place. Anka held a com out and he waved his near it. How long is an hour? She asked. Brad checked in his com. It's uh, about 22 mega clicks. Ish. Anka looked at the strange eyes that seemed to exude even more emotion than her own feelers could. If only she could understand them. I... Uh, I'll meet you here then. He took her to a bar that served intoxicants for every species she'd seen in the city, plus a few she hadn't. Why is everything here so uh, mixed? She asked. How so? It's a human world, and sure, there's an interstellar university here, but there are so many non-humans that seem right at home. A band set up on a small stage, made up of one human, one Grishank, two Kalanthus, and a Kurian. Brad pointed to the stage. That band is local. They're all brothers and sisters. Their father is human and their mother is a Korean refugee. How? They're not even the same species. How much do you know about the Grishakal and the war? I know it went on for a long time. And uh, at one point, the Grishak took a Korean system to use as a choke point for the Kalantha space. Yeah, it was horrible. I mean, I was still a kid, first hearing about it. Humans heard about it and told their children yes and no. While it was happening, humans heard about it and broadcasted throughout human space. That kind of story tends to lead the news, Brad shrugged. As kids, people around my age didn't have a choice but to be exposed to the war. And the human response, the Galactic Family Initiative. The younger generations are taught about it as part of galactic social studies. But the OGFI is still active, and humans adopt children who need a home, regardless of their species. Is there some way you're going with this? The band started playing loud, crunching, percussive music, and Brad activated the sound dampener on the booth. Yeah, those people on stage are all siblings by adoption. Is this a human ritual to make someone your sibling? Like, uh, we do this and then we're siblings? Uh, no, 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 not in that way, no. Brad took a sip of his drink. The war orphaned a lot of kids, Grishak, Kalantha, Karuyan, and some others whose parents were in the wrong place at the wrong time. Ah, what the Grishak referred to as secondary non-war casualties. Exactly. Grishaks and Curians don't take a child in unless it's blood-related. Kalanthus will take in a Kalantha child, sometimes, but only if the family taking them in already has an older child and is well off financially. Humans, though, see a child in need and feel the need to help, even if it's difficult financially. Anka thought about this. So those Curians I met earlier today, they could barely pronounce a common name, a... Uh, uh, th they were orphans? No, wait. She said they were born in a human world. Uh, about your age or younger? He asked. Yes, sir. Uh, th they seem to be so. Then they were probably the children of adopted orphans. It has been 42 years. What is that? Uh, 16 or 17 periods since the start of the war, and nearly that long since the attack on the Korean colony system. I hadn't thought of that. I'm 12 periods old myself, and late getting into university. The war ended while I was still young. How about you? I'm not so good with figuring out human ages myself. I am 56 years old, 22, almost 23 periods old. Wow. Oh, I hadn't expected that. She finished her drink in a short order and raised her hand to get another. Brad shifted to Curing Common. I'm sorry, did I make you uncomfortable? No, she said, shifting language along with him. It's just that uh, you're old enough to be my progenitor, and yet you speak to me as an equal. Yeah, you see, that's the thing we humans had to figure out before we killed ourselves. Just because someone's skin is a different color, it doesn't make them more or less than someone else. 
The same goes for age, sex, you name it. He sipped on his drink some more. When we moved out into the galactic community, we applied that same philosophy to everyone we met. I mean, you'll find multiple species and plenty of worlds and stations. Not just human, but we do it a little differently. How is that? We learned a long time ago that segregating yourself or others just creates more problems than it solves. Living side by side, growing up knowing lots of people who look different than you, makes it easier to recognize the ways that you are the same. That's nowhere more evident than in the mixed species families you'll find on human worlds. Mixed species families? Um, are we, uh, is this a human courtship ritual? Brad laughed. <laughs> Hardly. I'm just here to help ease you into the city. Besides, my husband might be a little jealous if that was the case. You know what? What was that human word in the middle of the sentence? Husband. I'm sorry, I don't know the Korean common for it. Male partner by bonding ceremony. Oh, oh. Why are you spending time with a stranger and not your partner? But I am spending time with him. Brad leaned back and pointed at the stage. The male Kalantha there, playing the bass, that's my husband, Kurt. He's the oldest of the siblings and the first one adopted. He's a couple years, a little less than a period, younger than me. But we pretty much grew up together. You humans mix like this, and there are no problems? No, no. There are problems. Some humans still dislike other humans with a different color of skin even. And sure, there are some non-humans who don't like living near people who are different. But for the most part, it works pretty well. And those who don't like it tend to settle on remote colonies where they don't have to integrate. How long will the humans keep adopting orphans? She asked. Until there are no more, Brad answered with a wink. End of story. I would just quickly like to thank the T5 peeps. Dragon Soup, Cold War Boomer Waffen, Severin Cerberus, Red Panda 121, Leslie 517, Bushmaster 177, Casper Arnholtz, Cam Maxwell, Sans the Skeleton, Lightjock, Dragzoon WRE, and Lord Azrakal. Thank you very much.